Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about levels of seeking the good. And this is part of our move into the natural moral law. Now, I'm not going to project my notes for this one, but there is an outline that is provided for you in Canvas. Um, I'm not doing it because I'm having technical difficulties, and so I'm just going to use the camera by itself today. Uh, but I will be reading off the um, outline for you. So if you recall, we've been talking about presuppositional thinking, a method of dealing with more basic issues first, less basic issues second. And so the way we seek the good is presuppositional as well. And it starts with reason and reason grasping the meaning or the nature of things. And then we go to truth. And we want the truth about the good. What is the good? Can we uh, get to the reality of the good? And then we talk about knowledge. So reason, meaning, truth, knowledge. Guess what it comes to? Knowledge of reality, ultimate reality, knowledge of human nature. And then understanding the good. And then wisdom and the good, which is application. That's when we get into applied ethics. Just to review, there's meta ethics, which is talking about the things you do before you talk about ethics. There's normative ethics, which we have just completed as we went through the history outline and the uh, normative ethical theories. And then there's applied ethics, which is what we're moving towards when we get to the moral law. All right, so let's talk about each of these. And some of this is review. And some of this will go back to our timeline again. Uh, that timeline is important for us to understand how we, why we do ethics the way we do now. All right, so the first level, reason. Human beings are rational. Remember we had at least three videos on reason. Reason in itself, reason in its use, reason in us. <clears throat> the first use of reason is grasping concepts. And concepts are where we grasp the nature or the meaning of the thing. And this already assumes that reason is ontological. Reason applies to being. Now, if you have a question about that or a problem with that, review the reason handout, review the reason videos, review my 15-part Retrieving Reason podcast. Reason grasps the meaning of the thing, the nature of the thing, and expresses it with words, terms, or symbols. So language. Language expresses meaning. Concepts grasp the nature of things. So reason applies to being. And the nature of things uh, reveal what's good for things. So there's a connection between the nature of things and the nature of the good. Good for a being is based on the nature of a being. Remember, this is from Aristotle. Now, someone could object to these things, and you're free to object. You don't have to agree. Um, but the way you can object is say there are no natures of things, like those who are moving towards those second two columns in the history of philosophy timeline are doing. There are no natures. Reason is not ontological. But that also runs into a host of problems. Or you could go with that third column. Reason doesn't grasp natures. Maybe there are natures. We just can't know them. Um, or you can go with there is no meaning. There's no logical meaning. The laws of thought are, are uh, fictions, like Nietzsche might say. Um, reason is not ontological, so there's no ontological meaning. There's no meaning that we grasp from the world, which makes one wonder what is science doing. And uh, there's no existential meaning. There's just nihilism. So our lives have no meaning. And uh, I have talked about this in other places as coming from Frederick Nietzsche's uh, death of God theory. And when God is dead, meaning God has no um, cultural relevance, then we are left with nihilism. And there's a philosopher named Martin Heidegger who talks about Nietzsche as proposing two kinds of nihilism. Negative nihilism, which says... Uh, we should tear down 
all of the old moral order stemming from Plato to his own time. Uh, let me show you on our history. So from Plato, 427 before Common Era, to Nietzsche, which is uh, 1844, all of that philosophy needs to go. This is what uh, the critique is about, critiquing, and the tradition of criticism and critical theory. That we'll call negative nihilism. It's, it's also in postmodernism. Postmodernism is deconstructing. Uh, and so if there's no meaning, all those who say there is must be deconstructed. But there's also positive nihilism, says Heidegger. And positive nihilism is willing out beyond ourself into the broader society new values. And so instead of talking about morality and a moral law, we talk about values, okay? And these values are willed out beyond. And it's usually for the goal of accomplishing pleasure of some sort. And it's communal. So uh, we have pragmatism as a, a philosophical, I don't know if it's a system. It's probably not a system. It's a move, a philosophical move to say, uh, we're going to do what works. Truth is what works. There is no meaning. Truth is what works for us and wor what works for accomplishing our pleasure. And then neo-Marxism is what we're seeing now in terms of the critical theories, many different critical theories in their application where we want to uh, gain equity. So this is another version of the positive nihilism, new values. The old values must go. Once we've deconstructed them, we've got new values. And maybe it's in the, uh, the way of social justice. Okay, so uh, those are the alternatives. So you can have, yes, there is such a thing as meaning in the world. And we can use that now to get to truth about the good. Or you can say, no, there isn't. Um, so truth and the good is the next level. Truth is what grasps reality being. And so we uh, had a handout where we talked about knowledge, definition of knowledge, and truth was part of that justified true belief, where truth is uh, what corresponds to reality. And this is, reality is, it's, a, it's a, a view called realism. Realism is what's outside my head is real in the world. Now, I'll have to argue for realism, but... Uh, until recently, that has been the dominant view in philosophy, at least in the West. The opposite is anti-realism. Um, and it usually corresponds with your view. Either there's a God and God created what's real outside of himself. God would be real too. Um, or there is no God. And if there is no God, and again, there's just nature, then perhaps that nature, the material world, is in a flux that is not fixed and permanent. And so there is no nature to things. There's no reality that we can know. Reality is what we impose on the world. Um, now, if we can't know the nature of things, we can't know the nature of reality, then we can't know the nature of the good. Because the good is based on the nature of things. So if there's no nature of dog, there's no dogness, then we can't know what's good for dogs. We determine what's good for dogs. Try telling the dogs that. You know what? Kino's not here right now. You know why? It got too hot in here. We had to turn the air off and he's too hot. He's just not having this. So uh, I had to listen to the dog and his nature. We run up against reality sometimes, right? All right, so what are some objections to saying that there are truths that we can grasp from reality. Well, one objection is truth is relative. This comes out of the tradition of nominalism, which I mentioned. It's that third category and fourth category on our history list where reason is not ontological. There are no universals. There are just particulars. So nominalism is naming particulars. And anti-realism, which I just mentioned, is the view that... Uh, we can't get to reality. Maybe we construct reality. Reality is a social construct. 
I'll let you work on that. These were links. I'll try to make sure they're working for you, but right now they're not working in my handout. All right, the second objection is that the good is subjective. It's based on our values, like I mentioned with Nietzsche and postmodernism. There's no objective truth, so there are no objective good. All there are subjective values. And uh, Nietzsche proposed the revaluation of values where we throw off the slave morality of the past that's keeping us down, keeping us from having a good time, let's be honest. And he, uh, he's an advocate of the will to power. Again, remember, if you get rid of reason, then we have the will to satisfy our desires. And that's what's happening in that fourth column on our timeline. All right, but can we know the truth? It seems like people want the truth. It seems like social justice requires truth. You can't have justice without truth. So I think truth is making a comeback. Uh, I'll let you think about that. But I, I'm an advocate of truth. I'm for truth and justice. All right. The next level, so we've gone reason, meaning, truth, knowledge. Knowledge is the next level. And we had a handout on this, so some of this is review. I'm not going to go into much depth on knowledge, but let's talk about it. Knowledge is a true belief with an account. Remember Plato talked about having a true belief that you tie down with a logos. Um, And we also talked about knowledge as justified true belief, the way that contemporary philosophers talk about it when we... uh, talked about Plantinga and Gettier and their objections. So we said, okay, we can make a distinction between weak justification, which is giving reasons based on sensory data that leads to a high probability of truth, like what science does, or strong justification, which is reason and argument such that the opposite is impossible. Now I'm going to show you how we can do that really soon. See these symbols down here? Oh, you don't have the handout. I'm not projecting the handout. If you look at your handout, there's some symbols right below what I'm doing, and it's going to be some arguments. I'm going to give you some arguments to prove some things, to get to the truth. So we want to have strong justification for our metaphysics. Remember, metaphysics is our foundation upon which we build that house, which is our ethics. Can we ground our ethics in something true? Uh, Can we have knowledge of ultimate reality? I think we can. I'm going to give it my best shot. My best shot. Now, there are some people who object to the possibility of knowledge. We've talked about this as well. We said uh, Plantinga and Gettier say justification is not necessary or sufficient for knowledge. Um, Gettier said sufficient. Plantinga said necessary. We talked about skepticism. Knowledge is not possible. Ethics is going to be really hard for skepticism. Probably we should go with existentialism. Fideism, knowledge is not possible, but one must believe anyway. Probably some kind of divine command theory. Agnosticism, I don't know what is real or good. Well, then shouldn't you stop acting? Because if ethics assumes choice and we choose things, we act on them. So if you're acting, then you've chosen And if you've chosen, then you have values. And if you have values, then you have a highest value, which is your view of the good. So you shouldn't be agnostic about the good. You should look at your actions and see, what do I really think is the good? And then go look at that list of uh, normative theories and see if any of them ring true with you. All right, now the last point here is if we can't have knowledge, then we can't have the good. We can't have knowledge of the good. And we're left with what? Going with our feelings, going with our will. So I want to now do something kind of controversial, and that's talk about the knowledge of God and the good. Can we know whether there's a God or not? I think we can. Okay, and I'm going to try to give an argument, a series of arguments. Now, in my Philosophy 101 class, we spend about, I don't know, eight weeks talking about these arguments. Here we're going to talk about it in eight minutes. I'm looking at my timer. Um, Now, again, these are arguments that you can study more on in my Philosophy 101 class. If you send me a message saying, hey, can I see those videos? Maybe I'll slip you some Philosophy 101 videos where I go into these more in depth. 
All right, so I'm on the handout, the good and the knowledge of God. Can we know whether there's a God or not? Did you know historically philosophers have spent a lot of time on this discussion? In fact, if you go back to that history timeline, probably since maybe before John the Apostle, people are arguing for the existence of God. It's not new. It's deeply rooted in the philosophy of um, religion and in metaphysics. We don't do it today because we've thrown out metaphysics. And we've thrown out metaphysics because we don't think reason is ontological. But I do, and so here's my best shot. So we want to know, um, okay, if things do have a nature, and we could know those natures, we have to understand where those natures came from. The first column in the history of philosophy, those first philosophers saw reason applies to being. Beings have a nature. How did they get that nature? Why is it like that? The second column says, because God created natures like that. And so we want to know, can we know something like that? Can we know if there's a God who created natures? So knowledge of the natures of things reveals God. And this is necessarily, if we could know the nature of things and we can infer from those things to the existence of God, there's a connection. And if there is a God, he did this intentionally. God wants humans to know him through the things that are made. Um, God couldn't be known any other way. If God is invisible, God's a spirit, he can't be seen with the eye. He can only be known by inference, mediated through the things that are made. And this is an exclusive kind of knowledge. You can't know God any other way except through what he's made. Has he made anything, though? Well, we can start with where we are. Let's start with the universal human experience. Something appears to me right now. Does something appear to you? Are you seeing something, hearing something, smelling anything? Well, that's an appearance, right? And we can say, what's causing these things to appear to me? And there are only so many options. It's either caused by mind or it's caused by matter. I'm not sure we've talked about these categories, so I'm going to pause and define those things. Mind is conscious. It's self-aware. It's thinking. It's not physical. It has no size. How big is your mind? Oh, it's in my brain. No, that's different. That's your brain. So what is matter? Matter is not conscious. It's not self-aware. It's not thinking. And it is physical, it has size, it can be measured. So they're opposite categories. Mind, no size, matter, size. Mind, conscious, matter, not conscious. And these are the only two categories. If you don't believe me, I'll send you a video on it. Mind or matter. So I'm seeing something. The cause of what, I seeing, what I'm seeing is either mind or it's matter. Now, if it's mind, there's two options. It's my mind or it's another mind. If it's my mind, maybe I'm uh, imagining it. I'm projecting a world outside of my head when there isn't one. Maybe I'm dreaming. Maybe I'm on drugs. Now, this argument I'm going to give you may not protect against drugs, but uh, or dreams even. But imagination, yeah. Are you creating what you see right now? We'll see. Uh, another mind could be God... Descartes thought there was an evil demon trying to deceive him about all that he is perceiving. Uh, I took a class where we were a brain in a vat being stimulated by a scientist to have this experience. So there are lots of skeptical examples that say you can't trust your senses. Another mind could be causing this. So my mind or another mind or outside all minds. Those are our options. Okay, we want to rule out my mind and another mind and keep outside all minds. So I'm going to give you two sub-arguments. Okay, and I want you to think about this with me. If the cause of what I see is my mind, I'm projecting this, then uh, I would have total control over what I see next, right? I could, actually what I would have is air, cool air in here. 
and uh, maybe some better lighting. I don't know. But if my mind was causing all that I see right now, then I would have total control over what I see right now. Do you? I don't. I don't have total control over what I see right now. Therefore, I am not the cause of what is uh, before me, what appears. Okay? So, um, if the cause of what I see is my mind, I'd have total control over what I see next. I don't have total control over what I see next. So, the cause of what I see right now is not my mind. That one's ruled out. Maybe it's another mind, though. Maybe some evil demon's causing me to see this room right now and giving me bad lighting. Um... And hot. He's making it hot for me. Uh, okay, so let's think about that. If the cause of what I see is another mind, then I would have no control over what I see next. But is it the case that you have no control over what I see, what you see next? I do. Watch. I can say, I'm going to intend to look at the floor. And then I look at the floor. Hey, I have some control over what I see next. And notice I intended it. Now, uh, you might say, well, maybe that evil demon's making you intend it. Do I know my own intentions? And can I intend to doubt my own intentions? And if I do, am I intending to intend to doubt? No, my intentions are self-certifying. I can't doubt that I intended to look at the floor. Um, so they aren't feeding in some intention to me. If they are, then I'm not a person anymore. And I don't have to worry about ethics because I'm just a robot. All right, but back to the argument. If the cause of what I see is another mind, I would have no control over what I see next. But I do have some control over what I see next. It's not the case that I have no control. I have some control. So the cause of what I see is not another mind. Now you can give me some pushback on that one. I get it all the time, every semester. Um, play with it, think about it, send me an email. But the... The uh, conclusion to this argument is the cause of what I see is not my mind, not another mind. Therefore, it's outside all minds and it really exists. What's causing the appearance is the material world. Isn't that cool? And so the material world is not a projection. It's not an interpretation. Well, maybe it's partly interpretation. We're perceiving and we're interpreting what we perceive, but it's not a social construct in the way we talk about it. It's real. The material world's outside of your head. So that's my argument that matter exists. I'm going to pause and give you the other arguments in the next video. We'll call this uh, Seeking the Good Steps Part 2, the next video. Okay?